Good morning on this Lord's Day. The day we celebrate the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. The words of Luke's Gospel, chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. When they bring you before synagogues and rulers and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you are to speak in your defense or what you are to say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour, what you ought to say. Let's go to the Lord today. Lord, we live in a world that is dark. Dark with political enemies and dynasties. People who oppose everything about salvation. China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, Russia, Africa, Sudan. People who are exterminated because they refuse to deny Jesus as their Savior and Lord. And you did say that those who acknowledge you before men will be acknowledged before God the Father. But those who refuse to acknowledge you before men. You will be silent before the Father. Lord, we stand in a world. Sometimes we think it's a safe distance away from the violence of other places. Well, just let a student in a liberal arts university challenge a professor that is an agnostic or answer on a test that God is not dead or a teacher speak about salvation to a student that asks, in a local public school, or a coach, or business that is designed and dedicated to Christian principles, being closed on Sunday, having Christian music in the background, or government places that have been scraped and sanitized at Christmas and Thanksgiving of anything Christian for fear of offending someone. And yet, Lord, this is where we live. Darkness. And we are to be the light of a world. Help us to be the defense in our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Here we are. And it's um, getting to be the season of Thanksgiving and followed by Christmas. If you've been to Walmart, you know Christmas is already here. <laughs> That's overtaken everything. Which brings 
the challenges of loss. An empty spot at the table where somebody once sat. The sounds that are not there. The emptiness. In some cases, the loneliness that prevails. And somewhere in a hospice ward, someone struggles between life and death. Struggling to breathe. And when there is breath, struggling with the pain. Or dozing off with the morphine. Or a patient who has just gotten a new heart. Or bypass surgery. Monitor the clock around with bells and whistles and perhaps loved ones. Adoption agencies, welfare workers that have a child and needs a place to stay. That's the world we live in. And Jesus reminds us he loves the least the last and the lost. We do have some things that we need to pray for. Southeastern Baptist Youth Camp is uh, paying their respects to Don and Sarah Snyder for 18 years of service. They thought they had the gentleman to be the director of the camp, and uh, he had been serving that capacity. Due to some heart situations, he has had to go home to another state. And there's conferences scheduled and uh, a camp to maintain and interviews to be had. So let's remember Southeastern Baptist Youth Camp today. Let's remember that at the Decatur County Detention Center, the REC is in full swing. The men's walk was last week. The women's walk is this week. And things are happening and hopefully lives are changing And then there is this church called to be a lamp, a light, salt. And every one of us lives in a community where our neighbors do not know Jesus. In some cases, we don't even know who our neighbors are. It seems like the garage door and the air conditioner has kept us inside and comfortable way too long. Let's go to the Lord today. Lord, in the deepest recesses of the cave, where the bats and the fish are blind because there has never been any light, swimming and flying in darkness. And yet, what a change just a match lit makes.
We live in the darkness. A world that does not know you, does not know your hope, does not know your sacrifice, does not know your desire to walk with us through the sicknesses and the pain, the struggles, the disasters, the disappointments, the divisions, the breakups. the thefts, the violence in our streets. And Lord, while we may meet today in this building, we are the church. We don't cease to be the church when we leave this building. We're supposed to take the light with us. We're supposed to comfort those that are going through grief. We're supposed to minister to those that are going through sickness. We're supposed to give those that want to take what we have and in violence do what they will. A government that doesn't even want to acknowledge you for fear of offending someone. And yet we stamp on our our currency and God we trust. Lord, we pray today for Southeastern Baptist Youth Camp We pray for the Decatur Detention Center and what's going on with REC this weekend. For those that are there volunteering, for those who are residents that are receiving and learning how to give again. We pray for the fulfillment of your plan and the salvation of people. We pray for those that are going through all the challenges of life today without you. Give us that opportunity. Give us that apron. Give us that bridge that they might come to see the light. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you stand, we'll sing our song before the pastor's message. The Lord's lean, laid on his heart. It's leaning on the everlasting arms. And if there ever was a time that we need to lean on his everlasting arms, it sure is now. <clears throat> What have I to dread? 
on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Today we are wrapping up our series entitled Footsteps of Jesus, our 13th message from this uh, series. We're in Acts chapter 22. We're going to be reading through verse 29. And um, let's read this together. Brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I now offer to you. When they had heard that he was addressing them in Hebrew, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. I persecuted this way to death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons. And as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify, from them I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were to there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. But it happened that as I was on my way approaching Damascus about noontime, a very bright light suddenly flashed from heaven all around me and I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul. Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered and said, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. And those who were with me saw the light, to be sure, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Get up and go to Damascus, and there you will be told of all that has been appointed for you to do. But since I could not see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were there with me and came to Damascus. A certain Ananias, a man who was a devout by the standard of the law and well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing near said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very time I looked up at him. And he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. Now why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. And it happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a trance. And I saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves understand that in one synagogue after another I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I was also standing by, approving and watching out for the coats of those who were slaying him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles." 
And they listen to him up to this statement. And then they raise their voices and said, Away with him! With such a fellow from the earth should not be allowed to live. And as they were crying out, throwing off their cloaks and tossing dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, stating that he should be examined by scourging, so that he might find out the reason that they were shouting against him that way. When they had stretched him out with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman. The commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? And he said, Yes. The commander answered, I acquired this citizenship with a large sum of money. And Paul said, But I was actually born a citizen. Therefore, those who were about to examine him immediately let him go. And the commander also was afraid when he found out that he put a Roman because he had put him in chains. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from God's word. This is the 23rd week in this season we call Pentecost. One of the more exhaustive and long of the calendar year that Christians look at. I want to say today, to begin with, we need to be the defense. We live in a world that needs to know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That no one comes to the Father but through Him. And so our response in the world matters. The image on the screen if a man by the name of Larry McKenzie. Now there's a lot of Larry McKenzie I found out, even coaches. and This Larry McKenzie lived in the 1950s. He was a dual witness. As a young man, he got polio. Was a farmer. Lived on a farm. FFA, 4-H. So he became the poster child for the March of Dimes and traveled the country trying to raise money for that condition. He also was a professing Christian. And whenever and wherever he had the opportunity, he did not turn away from sharing about the Jesus that he loved. After some of his touring was over, there was a track that was written about him. A Christian track that would be given out to people. In that track he says, I met a lot of people being that poster child. President Harry S. Truman. J. Edgar Hoover. Head of the CIA. Dignitaries and senators and congressmen and rich people and dignified people and Hollywood stars. But he said one day, I'm going to see Jesus face to face. And until that time, I'm going to serve him. What I know is Larry had his day and his context, and we have ours. 
Ours is a family context. It is a political context. It is a scientific context. It is a social context. And the good news is, as we said at the top of the hour, we should not worry when we are brought before rulers or dignitaries or whoever to make a defense. Because the Holy Spirit will give us in that hour what we should say. Now in this series, we have pretty much done a pattern, an approach to these messages. We've looked at a route of Paul's first, second, and third missionary journeys. We're going to do that today. We're also going to look at the resistance and a revelation of something that Paul shows us that we need to know and a result. So, as we look at this passage today, we've got to remember what had happened. So what had happened was an arrest that took place in Jerusalem. Paul was there to celebrate Pentecost. It was filled with Jews. Now in his travels, there were obviously people that were Gentiles that traveled with him. They came from other places to present the offerings from those Gentile churches at Jerusalem, the mother church. And when he was seen in the company of a person from Ephesus, who was Gentile, the Jews got into an uproar, they started to beat him. And the commander that was nearby, when he learned there was an uprising, knew it was a a Pentecost feast. He raced to try and see what was going on. So Paul is taken from Jerusalem to Caesarea. You see, there is a plot made for him to be killed by the Jews. So he's taken to Caesarea for security purposes. And it is there when there is a court that he makes an appeal to Caesar. Now that means that what Paul has been doing is put on hold. It means the missionary journeys and some of the letters that he has written and some of his activities are kind of cut short. This appeal lasts for years and years. Now Paul in that time becomes an author. He already was an author of letters. But specifically he writes his prison epistles. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So he's not exactly doing nothing. He is being a defense. And eventually he arrives all the way in Italy. And after he gets to Italy, taken by land to Rome, which is the capital seat of Caesar. Now, what's important for us to realize is this. The resistance that Paul faced was a targeted madness. We have to understand, if we do mission, Satan will not like it. And Satan has two plans. The first plan is to keep people from believing in the gospel. 
that we preach, he will cloak people, he will keep people in darkness, in fear, whatever it takes to keep them from believing. But if they become believers, his second game plan is to keep them from growing the kingdom of God any way he can. Be it temptation, be it fear, be it comfort, or persecution. Anything he can do to keep the gospel contained in our lives, he will do. Now, as we remember Paul and this journey from Jerusalem to Caesarea that lands in Rome, we have to realize There were some challenges that Paul faced. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 to 28. He talks about some of the things that he encountered in all of his missionary journeys. The times he was beaten by the Jews, 39 lashes. The times he was beaten with rods. The times that he was in danger from bandits trying to take the money, the offerings that he was trying to deliver to Jerusalem. The Jews that harassed him and chased him and the Gentiles who did not put up with him. Oftentimes, he didn't have enough to eat, didn't have enough to drink didn't have enough clothes for the climate that he was in. He even speaks about his thorn in the flesh. Some people think he might have gotten malaria. And from that there was tremendous fever and headaches. There was a challenging time in his life. But it also were some things Paul could grab a hold of that were celebrations. Philippians, when he writes that letter, he's writing to these Philippians in prison, talking about rejoicing in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. He's talking about the peace that passes all understanding. Here's the thing. Every day as a prisoner of Rome, he is assigned a prison guard. Now, I don't know how they organize this. If they were organized in three-hour shifts or six-hour shifts to cover a 24-hour day period. I do know he was literally shackled to a Roman guard for years. That man, he couldn't go where he wanted to go and establish new churches. But neither could the guard go anywhere else. He saw this parade of people that came to Paul. Timothy and Titus and all of the people that would come and he would send them out with letters and he would receive news and celebrate and talk about the gospel. The Roman soldier couldn't get away from Paul. So whether it was four soldiers a day or eight, little by little the entire Roman cohort came to understand the faith of Paul the Apostle. And Paul didn't know what his course would look like. He did not know whether he would get this appeal and be set free and be able to establish churches and preach or whether he would lose his head because the time that his court actually did take place, Nero was the emperor. And Nero did not like Christians. 
He says in his second letter to the Timothy, I have fought the good fight. I've finished the course. And I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. With the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but those who have loved his appearance. So today what we have is the revelation of a marvelous conversion experience of Paul from Acts 22. It's one of several defenses that he gives. One in uh, Jerusalem, but also one that he will give in Rome. What's important for us to understand is it gives us his early conduct that is documented. The Jews cannot deny that he worked for them and with them. The Jews could not deny the fact that he persecuted Christians, arresting them, killing them, stoning them. They could not deny that they worked with him they could not deny the fact that he was a, de- a student of Gamaliel, educated in Jerusalem. We have a past that is documented. It is a past that means we live as though they, we once lived as though there was no God. We lived in darkness. And did not know the light. We are also told about his amazing conversion. I've heard before and I think it's true. Those who live hard get saved hard. It would take something pretty dramatic for someone who was filled with such Hatred and such zeal to the Christians. And when that light shined as he was journeying to Damascus and knocked him off of his animal to the ground, blinding him, it was a dramatic moment when he heard that voice. Saul, Saul, why? persecuting me. And Saul did not even know who was talking. Who are you? I am Jesus who you are persecuting. He even was given a specific mission. A mission to go to the Gentiles. Now, let's understand the result of all this. The result of all this is we have a a memorable event in our life if we're Christians. Ralph Beatty, who was once uh, the executive minister of the great churches of of the Ohio region. I remember he said, we need to take our baptism as sort of a visual mental snapshot that we review every day as we came up into the water, sinners come up, new creations in Christ. Constant reminders of what happened of our proclamation with Jesus. Put that in a a snapshot that burns in our brain. The bottom line is this. Jesus told parables. One of the parables he talked about is the parable of the sowers. It's in all four Gospels. And you know the story. 
Here's the thing. We can be detractors. 95% of believers have never won one single person to Jesus. 95%. That includes our family. Kids. Grandkids. Maybe it's because we don't know how. Maybe because we're afraid of what might happen. Maybe we're just plain, we'll let the church do that. We'll let the preach do that. We'll let the Sunday school teachers do that. We'll let somebody else do that. What I know is this, that parable reminds us that packed ground, the seeds of God's word just lays there. It cannot penetrate. It just sits there until a bird finds it and carries it off. It can't penetrate. There are those who are so hard. The word of God that is sown, it lands right there and it's carried off. Some people, they're shallow. I don't know how else else to say it, but they go through the motions. They call themselves Christians. They show up to church. They go to the worship services. They sing. They pray. They go home. They never have a prayer time. They never read God's word. They never come to a small group. They never really serve in any kind of capacity. They just, they go through the motions. And then when something happens, somebody dies, somebody gets sick, It tosses their faith and they're never fruitful. Or seeds that are choked out because of all the things of life. Fears, yeah. Schedules, yes. Everything is busy, busy, busy. Worries, fears, keeping up with the Joneses, all the things that we have to deal with, the stock market and and our 401k and what's going to become of me and I'm retired and what am I going to do? And that will choke out the Word of God. But there's attraction. Every single believer ought to work to where they have five people they know that, first of all, do not know Jesus, and that, secondly, they know would be open to a visit from us to share with them about the wonderful joy we have. And five people they know that would never be receptive that we can pray for. Five people we know that we could share Jesus with, five people we know we would have to pray and wait to see what happens. You see, seeds, if you plant them in soil and the soil is good, they're going to grow. Some 30%. Here's the thing. If all of us would spend one year making those five contacts, praying about those five contacts, maybe we might win one person to Jesus. And around our dinner table, over a period of the next year or two years or three years, answer their questions. Make sure they get into this church or some church where they can grow in their faith and their questions are asked and answered. 
30%? I know there's people who give their whole lives to Jesus. Preachers, guidance counselors, professors, missionaries are 100% like Paul. What I do know is this. We are the defense. Here's some homework. Take the scripture today. Think about your past before Jesus. Think about what happened when you met Jesus personally. What did you hear? What did you see? Where were you? Who were you with? And what has happened since that time in your life? Those three things. And weave that in to something you could share with somebody in 15 minutes. That's called a testimony. It's hard to refute that we have a past, that without Jesus. It's hard to refute what has happened between us and Jesus. Nobody can argue with that. We're the ones that had the experience. We can tell people what we saw, what we heard, what we experienced. And we can talk about the changes that took place in our life. And you'd better hope that your life has had changes that they can see. That's hard to refute. So here's the assignment. Your past without Jesus, what happened when you met Jesus, and your future since Jesus came into your heart. Now, it might take you a while to put all that together, but condense it to a fairly carefully crafted 15-minute presentation. Because here's the thing. We call ourselves Christians. A Christian by name means martyr. We've died to ourselves to live for him. We sit here in a church that's mostly empty. It's not just empty of sinners. Yes, it, it is em empty of those. But it's even empty of those who are part of our family, our friends, our neighbors. And they do not know Jesus. And on the day of judgment, when the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ rise, there is no more going back. <laughs> Most of you know my mom died in the last day of July. She wanted to make sure that all of her children knew Jesus. And the only two she wasn't sure about were those who could not physically travel to see her. To know for sure. At her funeral, we talked about the gospel. My grandson,
wanted to know. So I had lunch with him the next evening. We went to Chick-fil-A. We talked about what it means to be a child of God. Everybody is a child of God, creation, creation. But not everybody is a child of God. I led him through the plan of salvation. And he said yes. One of the blessings of my life. But that's what Jesus died for. That the world might know. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, the fields around us have pretty much been picked clean, stored away into a bin somewhere where cattle and Products will be made and fed. There is a harvest. And we are to be harvesters. Now your harvest may be gathered in. Help us to think about our story. Five people we could share with that story around a table. And the five people we can't yet talk to because they're not ready. We can pray for them. Because that's what it means to live for you And if necessary, to die for you, that others might live. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to be singing a song of decision. Remember your homework assignment. Testimony, 15 minutes. All right, let's, uh, let's prepare our hearts for whatever the Lord wants to do in our lives and see what happens. shadows a dry thirsty land. He 
hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand with wonderless blessing each moment he crowns and filled with his fullness divine oh sing in my rapture oh glory to god for such a redeemer as mine he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand in the brightness transported i rise to me in clouds of the sky his perfect salvation his wonderful love a shout with the millions on high he hideth my soul in the clap of the rock that shadows a dry dusty land he hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers Lord, we leave here. We leave here in earthen vessels that has treasure, a treasure that we don't need to hide, a treasure that needs to be revealed to the world. So help us, Lord, to be your messengers, to be your defendants, that our lives indeed have been changed and redirected because of you. And that we would be fruitful believers. In Jesus' name, amen.